And then you're standing there going, you've just given me all this understanding. I'm just this feeble human. What, yeah. what does, what? what, I mean, and then you look at the globalists serving evil. They're like these demonic pygmies standing around a bucket of disease, worshiping. And you're like, why are they doing that? Yeah. You know, it's like as humble as we are, what are these devil worshipers doing? What have they given into? What is the point? Well, for one thing, evil is a lot easier than good. And part of the reason for that is that lies are nice and compact and tight. And you can put a lie into a nice, tight little package. But when you start talking about the truth, you start talking about the truth of an orange. And as soon as you start talking about the truth of an orange, you are soon talking about the color orange. And now you're in spectrum of light. And pretty soon you're into physics and you're into photons and the rest of this sort of thing. The truth is almost endless. It's yes. everything. But the lies are little tight, compact packages. And they're truth is the universe. Truth, truth yeah. is reality. Truth is powerful. And the evil aren't ready to stand in that fulcrum. That's exactly right. Evil is easy. I mean, it's easy, it's simple, it's, it's easy to understand, it's the truth. That's where you wander around and you say, what, what am I supposed to do now? Because it's so big. And the more you see, the more there is to see. At least that's an opinion I have. No, this is the most powerful radio I've ever done. You're absolutely right. My entire life is like, whoa, if the public could see this, the discernment, the levels, the, the endlessness, and then you see the evil. They run the temporal world, but they literally are these stunted, pathetic creatures, and then you don't <laughs> even hate them. You realize they're slaves. Yeah, I know. And they're pathetic in their own way. They think they're, they think they're getting over and all they're doing is condemning themselves to damnation. I mean, it is stupid. It's self-destructive. It's hard to understand. Uh, what do you say? You know, it's, it's dangerous. It's challenging. Uh, but you know, Alfred, God doesn't want some candy-butted, you know, good old boy who claims they're like a Pharisee up on the mountain. God's looking for people like Alfred Adask and others that are out there watching tonight looking for real men Real women. God's actually looking for people that have been worldly. God's looking for people that have actually seen the dark side and want the good. And you've got to just open the door. Christ is knocking. you got to open it. Alfred, what's your point on opening the door? People say, well, I don't have this intellect. I can never grasp this. Folks, it's not your intellect. You open your level. You open your mind to this spiritual information. It's over. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. It has, and you know what it has to do with a lot of what it has to do with? It has to do with trusting yourself. And I don't mean that in an egotistical sense, but so many people gut. are fearful. Yes, your gut, your, your common sense, you look at something and something inside you says, that's wrong. And everybody else is doing it. And it looks like they're having a party. And it looks like it's a lot of fun. You look at it and say, no, that's wrong. You have to learn to go with that inside that says that's telling you what to do rather than just following the herd because most of them are just following because they're scared to death to trust their own judgment part of this in my opinion you got to learn to trust yourself you got to begin to realize the good lord gave you eyes he gave you ears he gave you sufficient intelligence to deal with the problems he's going to handle you or hand to you if you're going to just follow the herd out of fear though and try to conform you know, from my perspective, again, you got that story of Esau coming back. You're that way leads to destruction. Life. You're back on the on on the birthright. I think so too. That's that's what I think. Well, Alfred, we're definitely on the same wavelength. I, I want to take some phone calls here in the last uh, thirty seven minutes before Tex Mars joins us. But in the next four or five minutes, anything else that's on your heart to add and give to this audience that's watching us across the world right now. Well, I don't know that I've got anything in particular. When you asked me to be on the program, I asked what was the, what were we going to talk about, and uh, I talked to Jaron, I think, and he said, "Oh, we'll just talk generally about whatever's going on in the world." And uh, yeah, we never, we never, we just say we're talking. Yeah, you know, it's not I like a, yeah. All right. Well, it's it's uh, anything else that's ringing my bell right now? I don't know. Third party. There's one. I have in mind to create a third party. All right? And I've had this in mind for several years, and I haven't had much success, and most people think that a third party is an impossible thing. It's just foolishness. But first look at the mathematics. In a typical election, half the people who are eligible to vote don't vote. In an off-year election, 60% of the people who are eligible to vote don't vote.
It means in an off-year election, for example, you only need the active support in a two-party election. You only need the active support of 21% of the people. Only 40% are voting. So you only need 21% to be elected, less than one in four. If you had a viable third party, the odds would go down to something like 13, 14%. A viable third party that could attract 13, 14% of the support of the, of the potential voters in this country could potentially take this country back in an off-year election. Number goes up some when you get into a, into a presidential election. But it's still a small number. One in five is more than enough to take this country back back with a viable third party. When you think about it, it's powerful and it's important because we are not being overwhelmed. We're not being defeated by the big battalions. We can take this whole country back with one in five, and I guarantee you probably 60% of the country agrees with the kinds of ideas that you've put out on your program and I put out on my blog and little programs I do and so on. I'll bet you 60% of them are sympathetic to what we're talking about. We need only one in five. The second point of this part of this third party, the party platform would be the Declaration of Independence. There would be no arguing. There'd be no additional planks in the platform. Declaration of Independence. One, we get our rights from God. Two, the principal business of government is to secure those God-given unalienable rights. Use that Declaration of Independence, and then there's no infighting. No party infighting as to what should we should have on the planks of the party. Use the Declaration of Independence. It's got everything we need is there. Well, I want to bring up another point, Jim. We're going to phone calls. Sean, Tripp, Jeff, JT, Keith, Ben, and a whole bunch of others that are holding. Alfred, look at Ron Paul. He came out and said, well, if I don't win the Republican nomination, I may run third party. He yeah. recognizes that it's about taking the field, injecting real issues, win, lose, or draw, we win. But well, and it's entirely possible right now. It isn't even, I mean, given the Internet, it can happen like that. If, you if can people attract, believe in it, if yes, they believe we yes, have yeah, power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you can motivate people all... <sighs> It's I mean, all up to them. It. Whatever they believe we can do. Listen, Alfred, I told George Norrie this, the other guest tonight. I mean, I, I go to like Arkansas, California, Las Vegas. I mean, I was, I was there doing a Jesse Ventura's TV show a week and a half ago. Every five, fifth people, every five, six people I walked by were listeners. I mean, that's power, I not know. that Alex Jones has power, that they no, recognize me and say they're listeners, shows yeah. our numbers are huge. You're exactly right. They're waiting, they're waiting, they're waiting. I mean, this is the sort of thing that I can't do on my own, but I'm telling you, I have thought about this on this third party. It can happen almost overnight. The only thing that's required is you got to get people to sign up to be candidates before the end of this year. The big obstacle for third parties to get them on the ballot in Texas, you need 50,000 signatures, at least the last time I checked the law. They have to be rounded up April, May of next year, you have about six weeks. Almost impossible to do with small numbers. But if you could get 500 to 1,000 people who committed and said, yes, I'll run for dog catcher. Another guy says, I'll run for state senator. I'll run for, I'll run for city council. You get 500 to 1,000 people. If you had 1,000 people who were running for, willing to run for office, they would be the people who well, would gather the signatures Alfred, you need. They need 50 when you run signatures. There's a piece. When you run for office, you educate people. Look, oh, it's yeah. resistance is victory. Saying no to this system and standing up against it is the answer. I want to go to some of these phone calls. You ready? Go ahead. Sean in Missouri, you're first up. Go ahead. Hi, Alex. Alfred, I just, first of all, I want to thank you both. Uh, you're true heroes to me, and uh, I appreciate what you're doing for our country. And on a personal level, I really appreciate uh, what I feel like you're doing for my children and their future. Uh, my question for you is, I've listened to Alex for many years now, and maybe I've missed it, but my question is, what is the tipping point? Um, I don't live in the city. I live out in the country. Uh, what, what is the tipping point where you draw the line? Is it when they come and ask for your guns? Is it when they come to and uh, demand that you uh, vaccinate well, your Well, if children? I can answer that, then Alfred can. In Texas... In 1832 or 33, it was when they came to take the guns. In 1775, it was when they came to keep, uh, you know, take the guns. In other places, it was when they came to take people's children for conscription. 
at a certain point, it's when they come to lay their hands on you. And that's what TSA is, is a ritual to put their hands all over you for forced inoculations, to train you that they're going to set up checkpoints. It's a federal martial law ritual to acclimate as many as they can. Alfred, what is the tipping point? Tipping point is when the people, it isn't so much what the government does. It's when the people finally say enough. It's it's the government. Uh, the the American Revolution was over an, a tax that was something like two or three percent. They were paying almost no taxes compared to what we do today. It wasn't a number so much what the government did. It's when the people just finally stand up and say enough of this crap. And we're not so far from that. Again, Tea Party was a demonstration. We're close to that tipping point. The Occupy Wall Street movement and the and the fact that it's spread around the world indicates that we are close. The Arab Spring indicates that there is a sentiment in the world where people have had about enough of government. Now we're going to sit back and watch, and there's going to be an event. And it was kind of like the guy in Tunisia who set himself on fire. He finally just had enough, and he went out and he said, I can't deal with all this government regulation anymore. Doused himself in gasoline, set himself on fire, and he precipitated the Arab Spring. All right? Something like that is going to happen. And the globalists tried to steer it and control it, but they're still going to fail at the end of the day. And... And that's the issue is that now is the time to warn people. Now is the time to identify the real enemy. Now is the time to talk about the new world order because all these people are awakening, but the globalists are going to try to misdirect them into false solutions. Caller, anything else? just want to make sure I, I kind of have it, have it straight here. Um, so you're saying, uh, for in your personal opinion, when, when they come and ask for the guns like they did during Katrina, uh, that would be a time that would be worth saying no and they and of course they'll insist on taking them anyway and then that's when you're going to have you you feel that a ruby ridge type here's the deal it. we're <laughs> as alfred said earlier we're hurting them politically and with our speech and like like gandhi letting them abuse us is waking everybody up i'm not looking for a fight anybody who's been in a real fight isn't looking for one yeah. the point is I'm trying to control myself not to get in the fight because every minute we suck them in deeper is 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 a closer to victory. It's but but yes, but yes, that is your own personal moment where you can't take anymore and you're being assaulted. Generally, it's about defense. You don't use this knowledge in attack. You're always stronger. I mean. T take myself. I, I grew up in Dallas. I thought everybody got in fist fights every weekend. I grew. I moved down to Austin. Nobody gets in fist fights. I love it. I'm not looking for a fight. But I always learned every fight where somebody attacked me, it didn't matter if they were big and bad and the state wrestling champion, if they attacked me, I could kick their butt. The few fights I lost was when I got arrogant and got in a fight myself. I have no power when I'm on the offensive. When I'm on the defense, look out. I appreciate your call. Comments on that, Alfred? Uh, the only thing I'd say is Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote the Arch uh, Gulag Archipelago, and he was talking about the prisoners in the Soviet concentration camps. Oh, how they burned in the camps. They were constantly debating when should they have stood up and fought. All right. At what point? Because if anyone, when they came in to arrest these people, if anyone, was, if they knew there was someone standing behind the door with just a baseball bat, I guarantee that the government wouldn't come in. It was when should they have resisted? It was a constant debate. Your callers, uh, Sean, I believe his name is, he's, he's, he's facing that issue. Where is the tipping point? Nobody's got an answer for that. It'll be something that no one sees, understands, but all of a sudden it'll be like tinder. Uh, there'll be a spark, the tinder will explode, and everybody's going to say, oh, my God, what's in happening? In fact, guys, pull up the Alexander Schultz and Eason quote. Alexander Schultz and Eats and How We Burned in the Camps, Pulitzer Prize winner, lived decades in a camp. Look, here's the deal. The key to guerrilla warfare, if it comes to that guerrilla warfare, is do not wait in your place for them to come for you. If it ever comes to that 